Okay, everyone. Hello, and we're ready to get started with our Injections 101 webinar. My name is Jennifer Wilson. I'm the Executive Director of Cassie and Friends, and I'm really excited to welcome everyone here this evening. Um, just a quick reminder before we get started, um, if you would like to listen to the webinar in French, there's an interpretation button right at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And just a reminder to everyone that your mic should be muted. Um, and if you have any technical difficulties, there is a call in number at, um, you can get that in your registration email as well as the reminder email that went out today. So just before we get started, we'd like to give a really special thanks to our sponsors. Our sponsors make this session and many others possible through their generous financial contributions. Um, and I'd like to recognize Nicola Wealth Management, Abvi. Amgen, as well as Sobe Canada for their support of our virtual education series. Um, as you can see here on the screen, uh, this particular webinar is part of a larger virtual education library. So no matter where you are in your rheumatic disease journey, um, whether it's a change of medication or questions about school or physical activity or even challenges around mental health, I encourage you to go to cassieandfriends.ca. Um, this particular area is a slash virtual education where you can find a huge resource library of our many, many past webinars, um, which all feature patient stories, expert speakers, as well as live Q&As. We also have Classroom, which is a brand new area on our website um, that has multiple resources. So you can see there injection support, an area for newly diagnosed families, a COVID resource center, as well as er areas like nutrition and a school toolkit that actually has tools you can use to communicate with your teachers. So we've really tried to build a robust library um, everything has been um, developed in um, partnership with our medical advisory committee, which is composed of pediatric rheumatologists across Canada. And we're really excited to have this resource library for you and your families. And if you have ideas about something that's missing, we're always happy to hear. So as you can see, we have a great turnout today. And it's really no surprise because this has been one of the most requested topic from past virtual education sessions we've done. And it's really no wonder because shot day is a much heard and feared and used term at Cassie and Friends. Um, just to get started, I'd like to invite everyone to introduce themselves in the chat. And if you like, um, even contribute one word that comes to your mind when you think about shot day or injections or what that experience has been like for you and your family. And we, of course, expect to hear everything from fear um, to anguish, to helpless, to paperwork. Um, so we're really here to talk about the full experience of what it's like to um, give injectable medications and how to conquer them as a family. So, Unfortunately, frequent injections are a reality for many children with rheumatic diseases. And as I said, the pain of injection is very real. And it's not just limited to the poke of a needle, but it's physical pain, anticipation of side effects, to sometimes heartbreaking emotional distress. And I just wanted to say that to remind everyone that after this webinar, there's a place you can go always on. Um, which is our private Facebook group, Juvenile Arthritis Canada. We have over 430 Canadian juvenile arthritis parents on that group. And they talk about injections. They talk about all of the struggles, questions, and also share um, the triumphs and like overcoming these experiences or the strength that their child and family shows um, in facing these challenges. And I really encourage everyone to take a moment to join this group if you are on Facebook afterwards um, and just know that there's a community that's always here to support you. Um, so quickly, lastly, before we get started, a couple of things. Right after this webinar, you're going to receive a link to a survey. And um, the feedback from these surveys has really been so invaluable in helping us plan 
future sessions in responding to the community's needs and understanding what are the gaps and what are the challenges and what are the ways that we can be there for your family. So I really hope that you will fill out the survey, let us know uh, what worked, what other sessions you might like to hear. Um, and also there'll be a list of injection resources that can support you long after the webinar. It is also a very special day on Monday, November 30th, and that is Giving Tuesday, um, which is uh, the world's largest day of philanthropy and giving. And we're really excited to be a part of Giving Tuesday um, and also to launch our brand new Cassie and Friends Care and Research Network. Our vision at Cassie and Friends is a pain-free future for kids. And we'd like to invite you to learn more about crew which is the cassie and friends care and research network and the ways that you can get involved from donating to sharing to educating others um, and you can find all that information at cassieandfriends.ca slash giving season lastly stay tuned um, we're really excited to um, be organizing another full year of virtual education um, and 2022 will also include a special event in follow up to this session today, um, which will be a small group training. So a chance for parents and their kids to actually get real hands on um, information and training around distraction techniques, parental coping, child coping, etc. So everything you really need to empower you in your injection experience, especially if you're having challenges. Um, lastly, we're going to do a live Q&A after our amazing speakers that we have starting in just one minute. So when you have a question, if it's during one of the presentations, just feel free to hit that Q&A button um, down below, and then we'll be able to answer all your questions at our live Q&A when we invite the whole panel on at the end. So with that, I am very excited. Um, we obviously have a full roster of expert speakers today that we're so fortunate to have with us. Um, but first, I'm going to introduce our first speakers. So our first speakers are Kaden Castangue and her mom, Colleen. And we have been really fortunate to literally watch Kaden grow up at Cassie and Friends. Her family, including her amazing big brother, Cole, were regular attendees at our Cassie and Friend Family Day events. First, Colleen and her husband Lance came there to get support and for Caden and Cole to meet others in the community. Um, but they also came back year after year, um, even when things were going well, to be there to support other families in the same situation. And I'm just so proud to have Caden here taking on this new role as a young advocate in the juvenile arthritis community and to share her experiences and tips for conquering SHOT Day. So with that, I'd like to invite Kaden and Colleen to turn on their cameras and join the webinar. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I'm Colleen. And I'm Kaden. Uh, we are so honored to be here today to share our story. It's a real privilege. Um, the early days of Kaden's diagnosis were fairly scary for our family. Um, when we were at Children's Hospital for the initial confirmation of JIA, I was amazed at how many people were there to support us, but that um, group of people also recognized that we couldn't process everything that they were giving us. So we got a lot of information packages. And in one of those packages was the Cassie and Friends flyer. Um, and it was family day coming up soon and we were able to go. That flyer actually was a real source of hope for us. It was information from other families and it gave us a real sense that we were not alone in our journey. We've attended, as Jennifer said, Family Day ever since, and Caden has also gone to camp one year. Um, we were told that Caden needed to be in methotrexate injections about six years ago. And it happened um, that a Cassie and Friends Family Day was coming up. And it was also the year that the lunch tables for the parents were intentionally designed to connect families with similar diagnoses. So I totally have a very clear memory. We were sitting at the table talking to the other families and I can still hear the one dad at our table talking about their experience with um, having to give injections. And he said, you have to pick one of you and they're gonna hate you and it's going to be okay. And then there was some banter about yellow being a bad color and smells as triggers. 
none of it made sense to us at the time. But in retrospect, the conversation helped us a lot later on. And again, the part that we came up from that lunch is that we felt there were others experiencing similar struggles and we understood where and who understood where we were coming from. I was not the one who was giving Caden her needles. In fact, I passed out getting my own ears pierced. So it was a pretty easy decision. The few times I had to take, um, take over when my husband was away, I had a friend come over for support. Um, I did ask my husband, I said, so for our, for our presentation on Thursday, what advice would you give to families? And, and he said, don't expect to give the needles like the nurses. They've done thousands. He said, just do your best. Our journey has been up and down. We've had some, some tough times and some times where things were pretty quiet and we, we bounced along and, and Caden got to do sports and enjoy life and, and uh, get into a groove. Um, we did have a hard time with Humira injections. Caden is going to share her, um, her strategies that she used for her weekly methotrexate injections. And then she'll talk about her path after Humira. That was when we started to see the needle phobia. Today, she manages blood work and vaccines and, and the, so forth. And she's been able to work through some of her needle phobia with a collection of strategies at her fingertips. So I'm passing it over to you, Jeff. Okay. Um, through all my experience with juvenile arthritis, I found it easier to deal with stress when I was younger. I'm now 14. Distractions were a great tool to help get my mind away from the fact that I was about to have an injection. As I got older, it was harder to find distractions that worked because my mind was so set on the injection. I had many strategies to keep myself from thinking about what was about to happen to me. For example, one, one of the systems my parents and I had was a reward system. When I first started injection, it was a simple sticker that felt amazing to put on my wall. It felt like I had accomplished so much. The sticker strategy worked until later on when I got older, this amount of stickers became overwhelming. Other award systems like a piece of candy from the candy jar every week was great, were great. Over time, as I grew up, I also realized it was just a sticker. So our, our rewards became um, bigger things like small toys or activities I found really fun. Uh, they never had to be expensive. They just had to be good enough for me to think, well, how there's something at the end of the road. It was a great motivation for the big yes. I also had some strategies that were given to me while I worked with the psychologist. Some of the strategies were blowing up bubbles while I was being injected. Pinwheels and flags also worked great for breathing during the injection. Throughout the injections over the years, I have to admit tablets and phones have been such a big help. We found lots of calming and interactive apps as well as games and shows to distract me. I found that for me personally, personally one of the best distractions was listening to music while playing a game. This also blocked up the silence and sometimes when it got quiet, even if I was just playing even if I was just playing games, some thoughts still got into my head. The main thing the distractions were trying to prevent for me personally was thinking about getting how I could get out of it. The more I thought about it, the worse the outcome was. Another strategy I had was having a routine that prevented me from, um, to either be there for the scary parts or think about that. For example, when I first started getting shocked, I didn't want to be in the room where the needle was being prepped. When I came into the room, where I was receiving the needle, everything was already prepped. All I had to do was walk in, get the injection, and leave and do something rewarding. As I got older, injections became harder. Once I was old enough, my dad taught me how to prep the needle and everything by myself. It was reassuring doing it by myself because I trusted my own work. I always had to know what was happening, and I had to be in control of the situation. That's why the word yes was such a big deal for me. Over time, as I got older, I began to get triggers. For example, at one point, I became extremely um, touch and smell sensitive, as well as to the color yellow, like she mentioned earlier. <laughs> um, while my dad was setting up the injection, a lot of the time I could smell the methotrexate and it made me extremely nauseous. Saran wrap became a huge trigger for me. We used saran wrap to hold the freezing gel because we found that it was much less painful than the clear sticky band-aid that was given to us to hold on the freezing gel. Our method with saran wrap was, um, pretty much <laughs> we're just gonna, so we're gonna work together yeah so we would take the saran wrap and make like a circle like that mm -hmm. and and then i'm would... going to put on my arm because Kaden won't let me put it on hers right now and then we would put the little circle and put the emla inside go ahead and then we would put the saran wrap 
over top. I don't know if you can see that. And then it would hold the amulet inside. It also allowed Caden to feel better because of the amount of amulet being used. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so we formed a ring. Uh, next we covered, yeah. yeah. At one point, I couldn't touch it or things like it because it made me nauseous. I memorized the smell of saran wrap and I couldn't stand it. We had to work around the smell part because it was such an important tool. I found certain brands of plastic wrap were better than others, smell-wise. Um, we used things like cut up socks to cover my arm and mask the smell. My psychologist did exposure therapy with me and saran wrap to help me get over my fear. Once we took off the saran wrap, my dad would use a marker to draw a circle around the numbed area. Drawing the circle was a personal preference for me because I liked to know exactly where the spot was. Um, I also always looked at the needle when it was being put in because it was just for my own comfort. Uh, even though you could easily tell since the numb skin was a different shape. As I got older, I decided to not use band-aids because it reminded me of a needle. Personally, I like to be in control and know what's happening at all times. That's where the big yes comes in. Whenever any kind of injection was being done, I always had to be in control. I always had to know what was happening with my body. I think that's one of the reasons why the word yes was so important to me. When I said yes was when I said yes to them putting the injection inside of me. Yes was so important to me, probably because of my controlling personality. <laughs> Practicing the medical procedures that happened to me on my stuffies and toys, as well as having my parents practice, and practice the injection process with me, made it much easier when it got to the real thing. Um, I've learned a lot about myself through all this and all my experiences with this, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the Caden uh, did practice the process quite often, like right from the start to finish. She would go, we would, on non-injection days, we would go all the way through the steps. Um, and that was kind of that exposure process. And those, those steps seemed to help quite a bit too. Um, as you can see, Caden's a strong-minded girl. And most days this serves her very well. But when it came to injections, um, she was more successful for sure when she had a sense of control and we tried to give that sense to her through choices. We would be like, where would you like the MLS? Freezing so she gel. would, the freezing gel, where, like point to it with your hand. Uh, what time tonight should we do your needle? Or is this enough Emma on your arm? And so those kinds of questions built that sort of sense of control for her and it helped a lot. And she made those choices. But as you heard, she also wanted to be in control of when the needle was injected. And over time, um, coupled with our experience with Humira, she just couldn't get to the yes. And we, we had some distressing sessions trying to find ways to get her to agree. Um, I remember a desperate moment and I offered horseback riding. I thought for sure it would be the ticket and it was not. Um, but during those difficult times, that's when we reached out for help. And she started to work with the psychologist and things started to move in the right direction. So she has done incredibly well and we are very, very proud of her. Um, having this opportunity today to share our story and reflect on our journey, it has really surfaced how we have not been alone. We've had many people, family, friends, doctors, nurses, and Cassie and friends along the way to help us. And I think my only advice would be to reach out when you need help. So thank you. And again, we are incredibly grateful to have this opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you. <laughs> thank you guys so much. Um, that was really amazing. And I think it even shows just how powerful these sessions are. Because in our rehearsal, when you explain the saran wrap technique, that is not what I was, I, not what I had in my mind. And I'm like, that makes so much sense. And what I hear in your story is that a lot is trial and error. And I think that that trial and error can be sped up in being part of a community, sharing all these tips and strategies. And every time you said the word yes, Kaden, I felt more powerful in my body. And I'm just so glad that you found your yes and, and really thankful you guys were here with us today. So thank you so much. I'm so proud of you. Um, okay, so with that, I would love to introduce our next speaker. And that is Dr. Nicole Johnson. Dr. Johnson is a pediatric rheumatologist at Alberta Children's Hospital, where she has been working since 2004. And when I hear the name Dr. Johnson, I immediately think about 
the amazing comments I've read over our Facebook group um, from her patients and her parents that she serves, um, and also the warmth she's brought to some of our past experiences like our transition webinar. Um, Nicole is an advocate for the juvenile arthritis community, and if you Google her name, you will see several media appearances she's done to spread awareness and highlight the challenges of rheumatic conditions in children. Um, and she's continuing on with her advocacy and contribution tonight by being here um, to help us all understand um, injections as it's related to the juvenile arthritis journey. So with that, I'm really excited to ask Dr. Johnson to turn on her camera and join the webinar. Good night, everyone. It's great to see so many people out. I think I'm the one to share, or are you gonna share for me? You are going to share. Um, okay. And I will stop. Okay, perfect. Just want to say thank you so much to Colleen and Kaden. It's hard to follow such champions, um, but uh, I'd like to introduce some ideas about where you're going to run into injections. I guess I should do two disclosures. One is I did the, what I shouldn't have done, which is wear yellow tonight. Um, and the other is that my images may um, reflect needles. So I hope that doesn't trigger anybody tonight. So I just wanted to cover where you might encounter needles in rheumatology. It's things, and then cover some of our injectable medications, some suggestions around coping just at a high level. And then of course, you'll learn more as we speak with our nurse and um, Dr. Katie Birdie, who some ideas around coping. And, but just general principles about how to reduce pain at the time of injections and some support systems that you might find helpful. So in rheumatology, you'll come across needles in several settings. One could be with blood work. One is with the testing that we order. For example, uh, most of us know that the MRI machine, if you need to inject the dye, needs a needle and an IV start. Some of our radiology tests, such as a bone density, sorry, it should be a bone scan, sorry, bone scan or a TB skin test just before you start biologics, you would need uh, a needle injected. Some of you are very familiar with some of our procedures. So um, if you have juvenile arthritis and we're injecting medications into your joints, you would have had joint injections. If you have some of our other conditions, sometimes we like to take biopsies or a piece of the tissue, whether it be lung, kidneys, or bone marrow, and you'd see a needle there. And then, of course, are the medications, particularly methotrexate, some of our biologics, and of course, our immunizations. So uh, in our joint injections, you could have them done in clinic, which we would just do local numbing cream, um, a local anesthetic. If it's in radiology, it might be ultrasound guided or local anesthetic, um, with or without uh, sedation. There are times you'd also see it in the operating room if you have to go under general anesthetic to receive your joint injection. For our medications, methotrexate, and here comes the yellow one, sorry about that. Um, you could have med the methotrexate orally, but there are times when we may ask you to move on and do it by needle. For some people that can induce nausea just before you even give the medication, and that's what we call pre-anticipatory nausea, so you're thinking about it before it even happens. And sometimes you have symptoms after the needle, which can be fatigue or headaches or a sense of uh, vomiting as well. With biopsies, the common areas we might need to look at in rheumatology could include getting a um, kidney biopsy. And a lot of people imagine that there's a big cut, there's open skin. I just wanted to highlight that sometimes it's a needle that just goes straight through the skin and there's no opening. And this is just a radiology view just to show that the needle is tracking and that's how they know that they're in the perfect place. Um, some of you may have had a bone marrow just before you got diagnosed or before we start medications and we're taking just a tiny piece of bone. Again, there's no large cut in the skin. It's just a needle that passes through the skin. Similarly, for the lung biopsies, we can do that at times. Sometimes we do have to open the chest for that. So people ask, what about biologics? Um, so biologics are Medications who got their name because they're usually made by going through some form of a living source. They're produced by living cells and then used um, as a medication after they're produced in the lab. 
They're large in size and they're very complex molecules. They're quite different from what we know as traditional medications such as aspirin, which I've presented up top here, and below is our biologic in the blue background. Um, and they can be different from just combining things in the, in the, on your chemistry table. If some of you are in high school, you would have done some chemistry experiments. It's quite more complex than that. And because of how they're made and how complicated they may be, they can be expensive. And most of you will find that insurance is required. It becomes an alphabet soup. So there's the anti-TNFs, anti-L1s, anti a 6 and what that's really telling you is what molecule in the immune system that we're specifically targeting. I just listed some of them there because some of you might find them familiar. On this column, these are some of the ones we use for arthritis. For example, on this column, we use it for arthritis in some cases, but most times it's for lupus patients. What's become more um, important to describe and explain in clinic is what we call the biosimilars. So biosimilars are medications that are also biologic. They're very similar to the original uh, biologic drug that came on the market first. So for example, the reference drug is called Embrel, some of you will know, and the cousins or other companies have produced a similar compound, for example, Embrel-Z. There's no chemical difference. There's no clinically significant difference between the two. And these are things like how well they work, how strong, the doses, um, the purity of the medication, or the safety of the medication. And Health Canada will authorize biosimilars for sale based on the thorough com uh, comparison between the one that was on the market originally. They become on the market once the, the original medication has expired in terms of their patent or their uh, protection by law. And I think um, I just wanted to highlight, I think I put up a previous version of my talk, but I get asked, why do we use injections when there are pills available? So some of the reasons behind it could be, for example, with methotrexate, if we want it to work better, and in some situations, if you want to avoid the side effects of the nausea, because sometimes when it passes through the stomach as a pill, you get a little bit more nausea than if you inject it straight into the skin. Other times, it depends on what kind of disease we're fighting. So if it's for example, our lupus patients, if they have certain parts of their organs, like their kidneys, we're trying to protect, sometimes the better medications are by needle. Similarly, for arthritis, we do know that some of our biologics or biosimilars work better at controlling disease when we've tried some of our pills and they're not working well. Those are some of the reasons we would, we would ask you to step up or change treatment. So things that make needles difficult. Um, a lot of it relates to whether there's some parental anxiety around needles, but also our patients' anxiety around needles. And with that concern about needles, it could either be just a general appropriate fear of needles. And in other times, it is a little bit more where it becomes what we call a phobia, where uh, it, it induces emotions that cannot be um, easily overcome by just explaining that it's a safe thing to do. And I think Dr. Bernie will go into that more. I just wanted to highlight some family resources. I think I will stop sharing here and try to just get you the most uh, recent copy of this. Because it has some um, QRS codes that you might like better. Sorry, guys. Device. Stop share, I'll be share now. That's the right one, I believe. So, there we go. So, with these QRS codes, if you click on them, when you do get a chance to review this. Up, it will take you straight to the website. So these are just family resources that help parents with guides and some strategies to use for coping with needles. Other things that help, I think kids always wonder when you say we're doing a needle, they imagine, you know, that it's this large thing that almost looks like a straw. 
And we know that there are differences in terms of the length of a needle and also difference in terms of how thick the needle is. So of course, the thinner the needle is, the less it hurts. It may be the way in which it's given. So this diagram here shows you that you can give it in the muscle, below the skin, into a vein, or just under the skin. For example, under the skin would be your TB skin test if you're starting a biologic, and most of our methotrexate and our needles are just under the skin subcutaneous. We all know that location matters. So which part of the body we're putting the needle in. We also know lo location when you're actually doing it at home, whether you're in your room, whether you're in the living room, whether you found your safe place to do it. We also know that it matters who's giving the needle. And Kaden clearly told you that when she was younger, her dad did it. As she got older, she wanted to be more a part of the process. And sometimes we ask family members uh, to come in and do and help. Or in some cases, we have nurses or family doctors who are helping. The type of the, the device is important. So whether it is what we call a self-injector or a pen that looks more like an EpiPen, or whether it's a pre-filled syringe does matter. And in some cases, it's an intravenous where it's going into your vein and on a medical day unit. Practice matters. And here you see the little orange where we're practicing um, how to give the needle. Some of the things we've learned over the years, uh, Caden has told you about the saran wrap trick. I usually pass it on to my patients as well. Another one about smells, I've heard that the alcohol swab smell is also triggering. So some of the times we've said an alternative is just soap and water. Um, we have little devices like the Buzzy B, which is a vibration um, that's a distraction, and that's been helpful for some, using a cream such as Emla, ice packs, um, or just some desensitization, which you've heard Caden also went through. Things to consider when you're having needles. So what about travel? Yes, it is a time in a pandemic where there's little travel, but still, if you're traveling with needles, we always try to provide you with the letter and how to consider how to dispose of your needles while you're traveling. And we know that with injection site reactions, people worry, what if there's an allergic reaction at the time of the infusion? And just know that we have uh, protocols in place and medications at the bedside to make sure that if you are feeling something, we're able to deal with it by the way. Some support systems, I don't want you to forget about. Sometimes the parents try to do it on their own. Don't forget about your extended family members. And most importantly, right in the home, please don't forget about siblings. They have a calming effect in some. And we also need to think if, they're, if the patient is feeling scared, the sibling is probably feeling scared for them. So don't forget about them when you're thinking about what support systems need to go in place. One of the things we want to highlight, and Cassie and Friends does a good job of this, is to, important to remind you that peer-to-peer -peer support is important. Whether that's our classmate in school that they trust to talk about this, but also peers who are going through the same experiences are important. Your medical team, and depending on where you are in terms of which center looks after you, may have different combinations of these helpers, such as your physicians, your nurses, pharmacists, social worker, your psychologist. In some centers, we have the child life team, and I think Kaden and her mom, Colleen, spoke about this as well. And in our case, sometimes we bring the robot. So the robot comes and dances while you're doing the blood work. Other support systems, there are apps such as I Can Cope With Pain that teaches kids how to express their pain, verbalize it, and what to do to decrease it. We have support uh, groups you've heard tonight about uh, the Facebook group for Cassie and Friends, and Juvenile Arthritis Canada also uh, is called Juvenile Arthritis Canada. There's the um, Arthritis Society of Canada, and there are research groups such as the Peer to Peer Project, which is looking at teens um, helping each other. And there's also the group called TAG through Cassie and Friends where other teens with arthritis are supporting each other. And that's what I had. Sorry for having the wrong version up earlier. No problem. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Johnson. That was such an amazing overview and a great reminder that um, when it comes to injectable medications, there is a lot of different delivery methods and a lot of things to think about, but also resources that can help. And um, just to let everyone know, if you are scrambling to take screenshots during um, Dr. Johnson's presentation, we will have all those resources um, included in, um, I believe they'll be in the survey email, but also um, we have an injection support um, section in classroom on the cassiumfriends.ca website. So you'll be able to find all of those amazing resources there. 
Um, so thank you so much. Um, next up, I'm really excited to uh, introduce Lynn Broderick. And Lynn Broderick is the pediatric rheumatology nurse at IWK Health Center in Nova Scotia. Lynn has 14 amazing years of walking the path of juvenile arthritis and other rheumatic diseases with kids and families. And as a pediatric nurse, Lynn works with families to navigate the injection experience. Um, we know through and through at Cassie and Friends how dear and important the pediatric rheumatology nursing position is to families and how much support um, and alliance and partnership they find. Um, so we're really excited to have Lynn here to share information about what to expect once an injectable, injectable medication is prescribed. Um, so Lynn, if you'd like to turn on your video, um, I will love to welcome you to present. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, so what happens when an injectable medication is prescribed and what are the next steps? So after having a discussion with your physician and the medication has been um, prescribed, Generally, you'll meet with the nurse um, or the pharmacist. And uh, we know that certain injectable medication is a process and we're here to help navigate through, help you navigate through that process. So we'll sit down with families and sort of have some conversation around who might give that injectable medication. Is that gonna be the parent or the youth? or is there a family member, grandparent, or is the nurse gonna give that? Um, oftentimes families would like to see what the device might look like. So often we'll have on hand some placebos. Um, youth may need to take a look and see what it is they're gonna be using. We have fake skin. Um, so these are the types of things we'll sort of look at. We'll have conversation around are uh, immunizations, are your immunizations up to date before you start on an injectable medication, whether that's gonna be methotrexate or uh, an injectable biologic. Um, have you seen the dentist recently? We wanna make sure that all that work is up to date before we start on these medications. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about um, child, how they've coped with blood work, um, starting a medication, um, that's injectable? Is there any fear, anxiety around that? And we'll look at, do we need to make a consult to um, our child life department or health psychology um, and how that's going to happen? Are you connected to support groups um, who, who can, you can share experiences with and hear from other parents and youth about their experiences? So we start that preliminary conversation once a decision has been made. Um, so patient support programs are connected with Metagec, with methotrexate, and they will provide injection teaching. Um, with the biologics, um, all biologics have patient support programs. In order to move forward with those, we do need to get consent uh, from the family. Um, so we'll sit and we'll re review the patient support program enrollments. Um, and we'll look at what is it that the patient support programs can offer to families. Some of the things that they can offer once you're enrolled is helping to organize the TB test, the TB skin test. They may help to set that up locally in your community. Um, I think in the past, public health has provided that service, but given that we're in a pandemic, uh, public health are very busy in other areas these days. So patient support programs can help to set that up if that's not done in your local hospital. Um, some of the other pieces that patient support programs will offer, it, uh, assist you with is the cost. Um, and concerns for families are obviously the cost of biologics, they can be very expensive. And how is that gonna be covered? Um, so once you become enrolled with these patient support programs, they will connect with you and help you navigate through um, the cost. So whether you have private insurance 
or you are enrolled with a prescription, uh, your provincial prescription drug program, they will help with that. Um, one of the big things we find from our families is knowing that they don't have to connect with their insurance companies. The patient support programs will obtain the paperwork and liaise with your rheumatologist to have that all completed and sent off. Um, patient support programs will offer injection teaching. Um, and some of the ways that will occur, it may happen at a pharmacy. Um, it may happen in your home or in a local clinic. Um, for families that live in rural areas, um, often I know in the Maritimes, we are able to um, coordinate with our VON, local nursing services that can drive out to rural communities or if families have limited resources. Now, there are some families that are just not quite ready to give injections um, and this may, they may struggle with this a little bit. So clinics will provide injection services and in some areas, um, the patient support programs will arrange for nurses to go into your home. Um, and at any time that a youth feels like they're ready to learn, we can all always have that set up as well. Um, so there are some of the services that they do offer um, in the community. Um, when youth are sort of ready to transition into adult care, um, they may decide that they want to go to another part of the country and even out of the country. The patient support programs will help assist with that um, and transfer those services. Um, I think we had a, we did have one of our youth that went to Switzerland in the UK. They were able to sit to set up those services. If it's in another part of Canada, they will connect um, youth to a clinic close to their post-secondary education institute and even transfer prescriptions over to pharmacies that are close to them as well. Um, in terms of insurance, some of the private insurances may not cover the whole cost of the um, medication and patient support programs will offer a copay, which is important for families to be aware of, to ask for help with that. Um, another po important point to remember is if you are, uh, for parents, if you are, um, having your, your prescription filled at a pharmacy and not delivered to you, just make sure that you get a points card um, to collect those points when you do pick up your prescription. Um, I think that's pretty much the navigation piece of it. Um, but there, if any concerns or if injections aren't going well, Many local PD hospitals have pediatric units here in the Maritimes and will also assist with families to help navigate that injection process or do teaching within their hospital. And I think that's about it in terms of um, what the patient support programs offer. Thank you so much, Lynn, for being here tonight and for sharing all of that information. Um, we hope to get um, some of that information written down and as a, even a resource on our website because we can see the kind of valuable um, and invaluable also information like that points card tip. I mean, that's what you're only really getting <laughs> when you have a, a good relationship. So, I mean, that's just amazing. And thank you so much for being here and sharing that. Um, so I'm excited to introduce our final uh, panelist speaker tonight, and that is Dr. Katie Burney. And Dr. Burney is a clinical psychologist and assistant professor at the University of Calgary, where she leads the Partnering for Pain program. Um, if you get a chance to Google Partnering for Pain, you'll see that the work Dr. Burney does is um, particularly amazing and special because what she does is she ensures that the research done in the area of pediatric chronic pain is actually in line and generated from the lived experiences of youth and families themselves. And that's something that we also believe in deeply at Cassium Friends. Um, and it's why we feel really, really fortunate to have Dr. Bernie in our community. Um, she is also the Assistant Scientific Director of Solutions for Kids in Pain or SCIP, 
um, which you will see often on Cassie and Friends social media and resources because we've done some amazing collaborations um, with the SKIP group. And what they do is they work to get the findings of research into parents' hands in ways that are understandable, easy to put into action, and also through innovative challenges like social media that get the information to families much faster. Um, so Katie, I'm really excited to have you here and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for that really kind introduction. And it's a true pleasure to be here and to speak with um, the Cassie and Friends community, uh, all of the amazing leadership and support that you provide to families across the country. So I really want to talk from the perspective of a, a psychologist about how we can make needles easier, uh, particularly focusing on how do we manage needle fears, how do we manage any pain from procedures, but also other challenges that come up. I think we've We've already seen in the chat and in the earlier pres presentations tonight, even things that can come up with uh, certain types of injections that are common um, with rheumatological conditions in kids such as anticipatory nausea or vomiting or, or other challenges that can come up around that. So I just wanna acknowledge and, and just give a sense of the landscape. So actually needle fears are quite common uh, about 60% of children report some fear of needles. So these can range from fears that are quite mild um, to fears that are quite severe. It's a little bit less in adolescents. Uh, once they move into the teen years, it tends to lessen a little bit, but it's still 20 to 50%. And it can persist into adulthood. So we know that 20 to 30% of adults, and if we translate that to this community, 20 to 30% of parents um, still actually have a fear of needles. So it is pretty common and, and something that we can work to support. But we do know that that very high level of needle fears, I think Dr. Johnson called it even needle phobia, which is, is actually a kind of similar to other very severe phobias that people can have, like a very significant fear of spiders or heights or snakes. Um, we can have a similar uh, fear of needles uh, that uh, affects a smaller portion of the population, but can really induce that true fight or flight adrenaline anxiety response uh, in our bodies. So that's something we need to be watching out for because it can need a different uh, strategy uh, to support. The other part with that we know is if we are poorly managing pain and distress, that this is one of the things that can lead to the development of high needle fears. There are other things that can also contribute. So if a child has a very negative experience due to poorly managed pain and distress, how other people talk about them uh, can also start a uh, fear of needles. If, if we're hearing lots of stories and words and distress from those around us about it, and we kind of learn that that's something to be afraid of, or if we see someone else um, have a very distressing experience uh, that can start needle fears as well. Uh, but of course, we can manage that pain and distress. So those are some of the strategies I'll talk about today. We also know that needle fears can contribute to an avoidance of medical care. So it can contribute to challenges and difficulty in the short term, you know, with, with adherence to medications such as uh, weekly injections, but also to vaccinations or to blood draws, you know, just for monitoring uh, over the course of our lifetime. So really important uh, that it's something we can address. And of course, I already mentioned side effects from medications, associations that can build from medications such as anticipatory nausea can also make injections more distressing and more challenging. So the good news is, is there are some simple strategies or relatively simple strategies that can help. And a lot of the strategies I'll talk about tonight are helpful across all types of needle procedures. So whether that's injections, blood draws, um, IVs and infusions or immunizations or vaccines, we can use a lot of these strategies. There's a lot of science behind the strategies I'll talk about as well. They've been studied with all sorts of different kinds of children in all sorts of different settings um, and really consistently uh, show that they can be quite helpful, especially when they're used in combination. And we're actually experts on this in Canada. So even some of the international guidelines for how we manage pain from vaccines, for example, that are recommended around the world through the World Health Organization are originated from uh, leaders, researchers, and, and clinicians uh, who have really uh, created this knowledge here in Canada. 
So when we think about what we can do to manage pain and those low to moderate level fears, I often like to think about what can we do before, what can we do during, and what can we do after? One of the things we can do beforehand is to talk about it, really prepare the child about what to expect, what's going to happen, what will they see, all of those kinds of things are, are really important. Thinking about what are all of the senses, you know, the sensory part of the experience um, uh, is important. Uh, this oftentimes when kids are worried about needles, as parents, our instinct is sometimes to not talk about it, to not bring it up. Um, and, you know, like if we're going to the hospital for a blood draw, for example, uh, and, and our child is quite fearful, we just don't talk about it until we're walking in the door and go, oh, today you have to have a blood draw. Um, if you've ever tried that as a parent, you've probably noticed it's actually not the best strategy. And it can actually lead to even more fear and distress in the moment. Um, I can actually start kids to be worried about every time they kind of go to the hospital or every time they go to their doctor's appointment, um, that they're worried that that's something that's going to take place. So we really want to give them a bit of warning ahead of time. How much warning you give does depend a little bit on your child and their age. For younger kids, just a short, you know, even a couple of days can be quite helpful, but teenagers might prefer a little bit more time uh, to know about that ahead of time, even up to a week. But we don't just want to warn them or tell them that it's coming up. We also want to create a coping plan at the same time. Uh, and that communicates, yes, I know this is stressful. Here are some of the strategies that we're going to use that you can do, that I'm going to do to help. Um, so that it will be less distressing, less painful, uh, and we know, you know, to help increase their confidence and decrease their worries about it. So things that can be done that should be that could be part of your coping plan. Um, and if you're interested, there are worksheets online. I'll, I'll link to some resources at the end. Um, but you can work through this with kids ahead of time, and they can even have some choice in which strategies uh, they like to use. It's really important, unless your child has a history of fainting with needle procedures, to sit up. Uh, when we're lying down, we often feel more vulnerable, we feel a little less out of control, so sitting up can be uh, helpful. Uh, and for younger children, being able to sit in kind of in a comfort position on a parent's lap, almost held in a bit of a hug, uh, can be quite helpful. They can face you, or they can face away, or they can even face to the side. That can help your child to stay still, and but also feel comforted in a hug at the same time. Using something called topical anesthetics, um, we were hearing about Emla cream at the beginning. Uh, so that's one of several that can be used. Uh, and depending on the product that you use, uh, you need to put it on about 30 to 60 minutes ahead of time before the needle for it to work. Um, and some kids call it like magic cream uh, because, and you can test it out and show, you know, it actually does feel different um, after you've used the topical anesthetics. You already got some really great insider tips. Um, about using saran wrap over it. Um, you can get them in a patch. You can also get them in a tube um, over the counter at the pharmacy. The patch um, has a bit of a sticky over it. It's almost like a Band-Aid. And so some kids actually don't like that part of it, um, which is where that saran wrap can really come in handy. The trick is you need to know where to put it. Distraction can be really helpful. Distraction can be done in any number of ways. Um, watching a video, listening to music, uh, just talking about something else, anything that really gets the kid's mind off of um, you know, what the, the needle and what's happening there can reduce pain and distress because the brain's just occupied with something else. Um, and you can direct and ask questions you know, about what the child's doing, but something that's as immersive and interesting and engaging as possible uh, tend to be better distractors. There are devices you can buy to help um, with needle pain. There's one called the Buzzy, uh, which looks a bit like a bee or a ladybug. It goes, um, uh, there are a couple of versions of it. There's one that can go on the arm, but if you're doing an injection elsewhere, there are ones that don't need to go around the arm. Um, and it vibrates and has a little cold pack with it. Um, and that can interfere with kind of the, or it's meant to interfere with the pain signals that are passing um, uh, in your nervous system uh, from the injection. So those, some people really like those. 
You can use breathing strategies, taking some deep breaths. Um, if you're at home, also combining that with other things like blowing bubbles or those, especially little kids can also like those pinwheels that they see spin. And you do need to take some deep belly breaths, those really um, more deep oxygen rich, relaxing ones um, when you wanna see those spin. So, so those can be helpful to use in combination. We did hear a little bit about choice and children often like, or youth often like to have some control over these situations. And certainly choice can be helpful, but we also heard a little bit about where too much choice or choice in on not the right things um, can actually make things harder over time. So I've worked with uh, youth and families where there was a lot of choice about when it would happen um, on injection day, for example, and then it's not the thing that the youth was looking forward to. And so it would get delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. And something then would become the whole evening uh, of the focus in instead of being able to contain it to a shorter period of time. So choosing what you offer choice about. Maybe it's choice for where you're going to do the injection, you know, will they want to be in their room, in the bathroom, you know, somewhere else? What types of coping strategies would they use like to use tonight? If they're using distraction, is which video do they want to pick? Um, you know, all of those kinds of things can be really great ways to give some control and give some choice and, and autonomy to the child, um, but not giving all of that. So, you know, we we're going to get this done in, in the next certain period of time, or it's going to happen on this day. You know, those kinds of things uh, can be choices that you can, can keep as a parent. The other uh, recommendation, which does seem a bit counterintuitive if, at face value, is to avoid reassurance. So sometimes as a parent, our instinct is to apologize, you know, to say, I'm sorry, this is happening to you or it's going to be OK. Um, one of the things that we've learned from some very cool research is actually when we reassure, instead of providing comfort to the child, it actually cues them that there's something to be worried about. Um, because my parent wouldn't be reassuring me unless they were concerned about something. So it can actually have the unintended impact of actually increasing fear and distress instead of providing that comfort, which is really where the intention comes from, I think, for parents. So instead of reassuring, focusing and redirecting the child to use some of their coping strategies, you can offer praise, you know, you're doing a great job. I like how you're taking some deep breaths. Um, you know, what's the video that you're watching? Tell me about what's happening in it. Those are all alternatives for, um, you know, what you can say as a parent uh, to avoid some of that reassurance. And if you do have a child who has a history of fainting or feels faint with needles, that's something that happens in our body. It's called a vasovagal response. Um, and uh, this tense and release, so tensing kind of your abdomen or your trunk um, legs uh, for 10 seconds and then releasing that. Uh, and repeating that uh, a couple of times can be helpful. If the end, not try, don't tense the area where the injection is going to go. So if um, if you're putting, depending on the type of injection you're using or the needle procedure, you could also be lying down instead uh, if that's more comfortable for the child. And then your strategies don't stop after the injection's over. Um, actually, what we do afterwards can make a difference for how it continues to go in the future. So really focus on what went well, talk about the coping strategies your child used, talk about, you know, even if it was, there was distressing moments in it, how a child remembers that experience um, actually predicts how much pain and distress they'll experience at subsequent needle procedures. So we want them to remember the experience um, in a positive way if possible, but if not positive, at least neutral. Um, and not over time, if we focus too much on the negative, we can increase kind of fear and, and distress and, and make future needles uh, out harder. So talk about what went well uh, and celebrate it. Rewards are always uh, helpful. Um, you know, and I saw, so I, I think one of the parents, an anonymous question in the chat said, what about this is this bribery? Um, and, you know, I reframe this a lot. It's it's not bribery. We all like to um, get some reward for hard work uh, and, and get doing something that's hard for us. Um, I think we have to think about what those rewards are. Sometimes even just hearing praise from parents. You know, you did such a great job. Fantastic. For some kids, that's enough. Um, and we also need to be realistic about what rewards we can do. Otherwise we can quickly break the bank um, and end up in kind of escalating promises that we actually can't sustain over time. So we need to be thinking about things that we can offer that are more immediate 
um, and kind of more short term, uh, those tend to be a bit more rewarding and a bit more powerful and can be things, you know, for younger kids, sometimes people use like a grab bag of stuff from the dollar store. Sometimes it's getting to choose what's for dinner. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, um, getting to choose what you're going to watch on TV or some extra earn time on uh, a device or a game that they like. And as you think about for teens, uh, teens can also earn other things that feel really important to them. Um, being able to take medications is a sign of responsibility. Uh, so is being able to have independence with the car, right? So as they're learning to drive. So there's lots of ways you can build in rewards um, without um, promising to buy a car or promising you know, a big trip. Things that are more sustainable to you as a family, but still feel meaningful and are more immediate to the child. Those are kind of the basic strategies you can use for pain and, and uh, lower levels of fear. If you have a child with very high levels of needle fears or needle phobia, um, different strategies are needed. And this is a uh, kind of screenshot from a clinical practice guideline, which indicates that uh, exposure-based therapy, uh, it's a type of cognitive behavioral therapy, I'll describe in a bit more detail, uh, is the uh, best science-backed approach, the most effective approach for tackling needle phobias. And the principles behind this are really fighting fears by facing fears. So what does this look like in practice? It kind of has three components to it. Um, one of them is we built something called a fear hierarchy. So I just put up a sample here from a resource on Anxiety Canada, uh, which I encourage you to check out. It's a multi-page PDF document with some great strategies for um, parents and for youth around needle procedures. But this one's for a blood draw. So we might, we want to start, you know, we're creating a fear hierarchy up to the most feared thing, which is having blood drawn from a vein. Um, and we're starting at a much lower level in terms of fear. So we're starting maybe by just looking at a picture of a needle. Then perhaps we're watching video clips uh, of someone who's having a relaxed experience um, getting a needle and we gradually move our way up. Um, and sometimes we need to do one of the stages many times uh, to see that our fear actually reduces before we can move up to the next stage. You'll see there is some benefit sometimes to doing this with a mental health care professional if the fears are very high or if there's other components or medical kind of stuff you need to do it such as you know, the alcohol swabs or actually having access to a needle, but many of you would have access to this uh, at home if your children are having injections. So these are all steps you can take. We also look at thinking strategies. Uh, Dr. Johnson mentioned some of these where uh, some of our fears around needle procedures can be not based in, in fact, but our, our fearful thoughts. You know, So sometimes uh, people who are afraid of needles will fear that the, the needle will go right through them or will hit their bone and break off in their body. Um, so though, or that the needle is actually very, very big when in reality it, it, it's much smaller. So those are kind of misconceptions and strategies we need to address, but also thinking strategies. We also say positive self-talk. So confidence building, talk to yourself. I can do this. I'm brave. I've done this in the past before. This is hard, but I know I can get through it. You know, things like that uh, can be also helpful. And then building in those relaxation strategies, those deep breathing um, and other strategies to really counteract that stress response that's happening in our body. The last thing I really wanted to talk a little bit about is anticipatory nausea and vomiting and just wanted to explain a little bit about how it happens because um, it is reasonably common for or not reasonably common but can, can come up with um, certain medications. And what happens is, you know, we experience this, right? So we might have the medication and that can contribute to us feeling nauseous uh, or perhaps vomiting. And this becomes what's called a conditioned or a learned response. But because there's all these other things that happen um, that are really, you know, that happen at the same time as the needle procedure uh, or are taking the medication, those things independently, we start to associate with feeling nauseous or vomiting. So certain days of the week, talking about the medication or the injection, even just thinking about it, even being in the same room. Um, other examples came up tonight, like the color yellow or the smell of the saran wrap. These are all kind of things that become associated with it um, because they've happened 
around the same time um, as the medication, you know, associated with the nausea or vomiting. Some things that can help sometimes, uh, because it's this conditioned response, uh, sometimes switching up the routine a little bit can help. This can be challenging because sometimes the routine is comforting, right? It, it's part of the, the part that gives us a bit of control. But if we are able to switch that up, sometimes we can lessen these associations between these other things. So even changing where you do it in the house, is there a different order you do the preparatory steps, um, using some distraction and relaxation, and also doing some exposure to the triggers. If we spent a lot of time looking at the color yellow um, in the absence of actually taking, you know, in the absence of that um, injection and, the, and then the nausea and vomiting happening, our body's getting and our brain is getting a lot of experience that actually most times the color yellow doesn't lead me to feel this way. But we have to not avoid those triggers. We have to give ourselves lots of exposure to those triggers in the absence kind of of the, of the medication uh, as well. And, you know, there are options that talk to your rheumatologist if it's appropriate for you, if, if other medications are helpful. I also just wanted to talk briefly about parents' own coping. We talked about how 20 to 30 percent of adults uh, do have some needle fears. Your own confidence matters. Um, you know, uh, doing some of those relaxation relaxation strategies for yourself, um, or perhaps it's another parent, it's the other parent or someone else in the family who's able to support the child with needle procedures. You can also do those fear hier hierarchies to address your own needle fears. Uh, don't promise no needles. We know sometimes when we go to the clinic, um, we don't know actually if, an, if, a, if a blood draw is going to be needed or if a joint injection is going to be needed. Uh, and if, we all, if we're always promising there's no needles, um, we might end up in a situation where we aren't able to be truthful um, because a different situation has to happen uh, to support your child's health. Uh, so really, you know, a better approach to say we don't we don't think there's going to be a needle today, but if there is, I know you can handle it. And here's the strategies that we'll use to support you. Uh, focus on supporting your child's coping strategies, provide praise and reinforcement, and do talk about what went well after the fact. Some resources online. So um, Jennifer mentioned SKIP, so kidsinpain.ca is our website. You'll see up there, I've linked to a one-page handout uh, that talks about different strategies for managing needle pain and anxiety. It says for vaccinations, but uh, some of those resources are for other types of needle procedures. And as I've mentioned tonight, a lot of the strategies are applicable across needle procedures. Anxiety Canada has some great resources um, and the Meg Foundation in the US um, has some very cool resources as well, uh, including a superhero called Super Meg um, with some handouts and worksheets and other things that uh, kids can work through. Other people that can be helpful for you, uh, certainly if you're, you're at a hospital where you're able to access this, a child life specialist um, can be helpful at, in the moment, but some child life specialists also offer needle coping groups uh, at different hospitals or healthcare centers. And I did mention psychologists. Um, if you're able to access a psychologist at uh, a hospital or affiliated with your clinic, Many of them have um, experience supporting uh, needle fears and needle phobia. Uh, it comes up in other areas of child health beyond rheumatological conditions. Um, but if you're able to access uh, psychology through your employment assistance program or uh, in private practice, keep a lookout for those who have worked in children's hospitals before. Again, they, they're likely to have that um, real expertise with that exposure-based treatment, um, which we've heard both from personal experience, but also that the science supports as quite helpful. Uh, but there's lots of free resources out there as well. So these are just some other examples of things that are linked to you on that one pager on the SKIP website that I mentioned um, and getting more traction in the media as well as an issue that we need to be paying attention to. And then lastly, I'll make a plug for a colleague of mine, Dr. Megan McMurtry, who is actually the lead author on the clinical practice guideline for needle fears. She's in Guelph, but they're offering a free online session uh, for parents uh, and young people, so teens uh, who have needle fears. 
um, in just a couple of weeks on December 14th. It's a two hour session plus 30 minutes for questions. It's a free virtual workshop um, and you can just see the link there. So she is a leading expert on this topic as well and just an additional resource if you wanna learn more uh, and get more deeper into um, that exposure-based treatment as a, as a free resource right away. And you can sign up, learn more. We're always sharing tips through Skip on social media, through our newsletter, or through our website. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, while you were speaking, we got the ultimate testimonial of your strategies and work, which was that one of your patients wrote, Dr. Bernie helped us get from anxiety to meh about needle day. And <laughs> for those families who are still spending their weeks dreading shot day, I think meh sounds like an amazing paradise <laughs> place to be. So thank you so much for sharing. I feel like we have like, this toolbox and you just filled it full of, of things to use. And just a reminder to everyone watching, because we got tons of requests for the slides and um, the link. So we will um, update our injections. So it's cassiumfriends.ca forward slash injections. And we'll make sure that everything is there for you after um, the webinar. And we'll let you know by email when all of those resources are up live, as well as the recording. Um, some people are listening by phone, so it can be difficult to follow along without the slides. So um, just know that we're here to answer any questions and get those resources into your hands. Um, so with that, I'm very excited to uh, invite our whole panel back um, to turn on their cameras and we will move into the Q&A portion of our session. Um, I'm also going to invite um, a speaker you haven't heard here from yet, and that is Julie Beausoleil. Um, Julie is a part of our Youth Leader Network. Um, she is today a third year student at the University of Ottawa, but she was also once an 18 month old just diagnosed with juvenile idiopathic arthritis. And Julie's here to share a really important perspective um, as part of our panel, because we know that needle phobia is not just for young kids or young families, that this is, as Katie mentioned, it can be something parents experience, but teens and young adults can also have very valid and um, deep fears about needles that we can work with them to overcome. And so um, I welcome Julie to the panel. If you wanna be able to see everyone, you can hit the view button in the top right-hand corner and go to gallery and then you'll see everyone's faces um, and not just one speaker at a time. So with that, I'm just gonna get started with the first question. And I think I'm, I think I'm just gonna, Katie, you were just talking and I think you covered some of this, but the question is about knowing when it's needle phobia, fear of needle pain, or fear of the way the medication makes them feel. So you talked about all of those areas, but how do they interplay together and how do you identify what, what is happening? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, as kids get older, they're, even young kids can sometimes articulate this themselves. Um, but I think it's always a good, you know, as long as your kid is old enough to ask, definitely ask them. Um, I've also worked with kids who have struggled with certain types of needle procedures, but not others. So injections are okay, but blood draws are hard. Or blood draws are okay, but injections are hard. Um, you know, so having that conversation, I think, can be really helpful. Uh, it can help you just tailor which of the strategies you maybe want to use most. But I'll say some of the strategies it doesn't matter too much, right? The idea, you know, the principles behind face your fears and have some kind of relaxation and coping strategies to use uh, will serve you well, kind of regardless of which of those uh, is the primary driver too. Great. Um, Colleen and Kaden, I might actually ask you to weigh in on this one. Um, so when did you identify that, that you needed maybe some more support or help? You know, you had some tools, you had some strategies. Um, and then there was the point that you decided to, to seek some additional support. And how, how was that process of moving towards extra help for you guys? Well, we, I think for us, it kind of came to the most difficult time was when we were doing the Humira shots. Um, and then from once we stopped doing those, trying to get blood work done was 
it was just a mountain we couldn't climb. Um, we, we tried the uh, child life um, worker and different places. We would go to children's. That was where she felt most comfortable was to go to children's to get her blood work done rather than the local um, med lab. Um, and it, it just, I, I, there were some very sort of poignant moments where we could just tell we weren't getting anywhere. And so we had to reach out for more help. Um, yeah. Does that, is there anything you want to add? That's pretty much it, yeah. <laughs> That was it. Um, I think our next question is kind of in, in that same vein, but it's about, I think, tolerance and knowing when there's a mountain that you're just not able to climb. And um, this question, I think um, Dr. Johnson and probably um, Lynn Broderick, I probably both can weigh in on this one. So I think this question, this is specific about methotrexate by injection um, and a real struggle around that and knowing you know, when could, can I ask my doctor to try the oral methotrexate instead? Is there a point that this is, you know, how do I bring that up? How do I approach the topic? And um, so maybe it's about like the tolerance of the administration method. And then from the medical perspective, um, Nicole, Nicole, maybe you could provide some insight on like how those decisions are made. Yeah, those are very important points because I think it can occur at any time. It could be a diagnosis. It could be you've been using something for a very long time and it's going well, and then suddenly you realize it's not going well. Um, so I think the key thing is your medical team leaves it open. I, I hope that we all leave it approachable that you can talk about any challenges that you're facing with the disease. Sometimes with some of the teens, they say, I know I didn't take it for the last three months, but I, I promise I'll do it again. And sometimes that's okay. And I tell them that's just fair. I, I believe that honesty is the best policy. So knowing that you're not able to achieve it is an important piece to deciding, is this time to move on to something else? So being able to be honest about how effective it's happening, whether it's 50% of the time, 60% or zero, is probably the key message that you want to give your rheumatologist and your team because that can help them in formances. Maybe it's time to look at alternatives. They may not be perfect alternatives in terms of you might think that methotrexate works better at that point, but by knowing that you, 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 know, you can't commit to the plan is where you start to make some changes. Mm -hmm. Honesty is the best policy. Yeah, yeah that's that, I guess the other piece, right, is, is the struggle with the injection, but also just getting that medication that, that the patient or child needs into them. And so um, working together with your healthcare team is always just the most important strategy is to be open to communicate and, and don't feel like you have to hide. Like there is no shame. Everyone's trying no to do the best for the child. Um, Julie, I just wanted to give you a minute just to, to, sh to share your medication experience um, and also to maybe just let people know about the amazing uh, resource that you just contributed to our website. Yes, for sure. So um, as Jennifer mentioned, I was diagnosed with juvenile idiopathic arthritis when I was a year and a half. Um, and I was on pretty much methotrexate pills up until I want to say I was 10, 11, um, but they made me very nauseous. So I switched to the injections um, just because I, I really was not uh, liking the pills. Um, so I was on methotrexate injections for a few years. My mom would administer them for me. I did the saran wrap, the saran wrap uh, strategy that Caden had gone over, uh, very useful. Um, but I found with the methotrexate injections, um, the biggest struggle for me with that was the nausea and the anticipatory nausea. Um, so it was just something I kind of dealt with, um, but I ended up switching to Enbrel and I was on those injections instead. I tried the manual ones where I would measure the medication myself. Um, and I also tried the auto injectors. Um, so I think one thing that did help me was trying those two options to see which one I preferred. It kind of gave me a, a better choice. Um, so I switched back to the uh, ones that I mixed myself. Um, and when I was about 12, I started administering them on my own. It's kind of a funny story because my mom used to do it for me. But then one day uh, we, were ha we had an argument. I don't even remember what the argument was. Um, and it was on shot day. So um, she came up to my room 
with the shots and I was, I was a little angry. So I said, you know what, I'm going to do it. I took it. My adrenaline was pumping and I just stuck it in my leg. And since that day, I've been able to do it myself. So uh, not the typical transition story, but uh, that's kind of what made me able to, to do them myself. And to this day, I still take my Enbrel shots, uh, which leads me to uh, the resource that I did create. I made kind of an injection routine walkthrough video of how of my my process on how I do it. Um, so I sent, uh, I sent the video over to Cassie and friends. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be posted on the web on the website. Okay. Yeah. So it'll be a resource that's there. Uh, feel free to check it out. I kind of walk through how I mix my medication. Um, and then I show myself actually administering it. So if anyone needs any, um, resource or, if you want to talk about it more, you could always reach me by email. Um, if you reach out to Cassie and friends, they could direct you to me. Um, just if anyone needs any support whatsoever, or kind of like an older sister mentor, I'd be more than willing to do that. So yeah, that's kind of uh, a little short video that I did create. Thank you, Julie. And I think that's going to be a really amazing resources um, for uh, young patients who are going off to university or going into the workforce or moving and are thinking about self-injection even at any point of, of their journey. So thanks so much. Yeah. Um, we had another question and I, I think Lynn actually, you, you might be able to answer this one fast, um, but uh, someone was asking about um, what you've heard or what the experiences have been like with um, two new medications on the market, which are Julio and Amjavita. And I think the question is actually around um, having a pretty bad experience with an auto injector. Um, and uh, this particular young boy had a bad experience with the Humira auto injector and is now on Remicade. And so potentially is looking at other options. And so again, this goes to kind of the delivery method, but it, what kind of um, insight can you offer? So I think with, with the Humira, when it comes in the, the 40 milligram um, preparation, it's not citrate free. Um, so it does sting, which we know. The Amgevita, um has less of that buffer in it and doesn't tend to sting. One of the things um, sort of anecdotally that we've taken from parents over the years that um, our kids who take methotrexate and are injecting themselves um, seem to do better on a pre-fill syringe because they have the control of how fast the medication goes in. Um, when the auto injector first came on the market, I, I thought, oh, how exciting, this is great. But many of our youth really did not care for it. They don't like that click sound and they don't like the control over it. Um, in terms of the Amjavita um, and the Humera, um, we do have some of our kids who've actually uh, now take two injections as opposed to one because Humera now is made in the 20 milligram prefill syringe, which is citrate free. Um, we have some youth who've switched over to the Amjavita because it has less of the buffer in it. But the, the auto injector, um, a lot of feedback we've had is that the noise um, and no control over how fast the medication goes in. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, did anyone else have anything they wanted to add on, on that topic? I'll just add for the choices between the self-injector and the, the needle sometimes is exactly what Lynn said. If they've been exposed to needles and they feel comfortable handling it, or their family feels come to handle it, they will choose the pre-fill syringe. If they've had no exposure with syringes, sometimes they like the pen because they don't see the actual needle, but we do give them uh, an opportunity to practice in the clinic or to see how it works um, so that they get an idea of what they're choosing. Um, and if they don't like seeing a needle and that's aggravating, then sometimes the pen works better. Um. So on the sort of a same topic, but a different kind of injection, um, we're going to switch over to infusions. And the question is, um, and I think maybe Dr. Johnson, if you want to get started on this one, what can be done at infusions if they're having trouble keeping the vein open? 
Um, so some of the techniques that Dr. Bernie talked about are also helpful. So in terms of imagining this is a time when you were giving a needle, so positions of comfort, relaxation techniques will help open the vessels. If it's someone who's had a lot of blood work and a lot of IVs, it may still be challenging because the blood vessels haven't had time to heal and repair. So that is usually typically the scenario where they would have to change locations a lot or sometimes ask the anesthesiologist who are very comfortable with giving, uh, you know, who have to do injections and finding veins that, that don't open as well. But it's the same concept. We hydrate the kids. We tell them drink a lot before you come for infusion day in the morning. We know sometimes they're rushing out early in the morning, but they might drink just as they arrive to the hospital. So being well hydrated helps a lot. Being very warm rather than being cold helps a lot. And being relaxed helps a lot. And we have child life sometimes or the, you know, the reward systems and things like that to keep the kids that it's a good day and a, and a happy day while they're doing what, what needs to be done. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Bernie, you talked a little bit about, um, I think it was, hold on, I wrote it down, the comfort position. So the hug. Um, we had another question about, um, you know, a position recommendations for a five to nine year old. So maybe not into that comfort hug or, or position anymore. Um, they have two adults in the room. So um, one maybe could snuggle, one could administer the direction, but the injection, but what are some other positions that you've heard of? And then definitely afterwards, Caden, if you have any preferred positions or Julie, let us know. I was actually going to say Colleen and Kaden might be great to answer this this question, but you know I I think it depends on your child, obviously, right? And and I it's funny I've been part of some conversations recently where they say, you know, kids that are older in this like middle childhood part they don't like the comfort positions, but some really do, right? Like some actually being able to snuggle in with a parent is still really comforting, um, even if you're you know um, not a preschooler anymore, but you're you know still in grade three and grade four and even older, right? You know, so I think, I think not assuming, but, you know, being able to check in with a child about that um, is, is really important, but curious what Colleen and, and Kaden think. Um, so probably the main thing was not laying down, but um, because of like control, but we had quite a few so for like probably the past like four years now, I've just been I hold one parent's hand and some or something like that. And then I hold one parent's hand and then the other um, gives the injection. Uh, sometimes I look away, but usually the person who's giving the injection is either on the side of me or behind me. And then I'm looking at somebody in front of me. So then my eyes are forward. But that's like the main thing is unless you want to look at it, but it always gives you the option because sometimes some days it's like, oh, I'd love to like look just to make sure everything's going good. And some days it's like, I want to look at somebody and like hold hands, things like that, but snuggling is so good. <laughs> I, I often teed up a fairly thoughtful question, sort of in the moment to redirect something like, so I, I found some money and I'm just wondering what would you spend it on? Like just something that's surprising, but positive. And hmm. yeah, I, I've done that a few times. It takes a bit of thought, but it helps. Another thing that just came to mind too that I've heard before is that um, often like the sisters and brothers will get involved on injection day. And I know I'm just thinking about one family and they were doing um, anakinra, which is quite painful as well. Um, but one sibling would play war, like the card game, um, while they were doing shot, someone else would hug, um, someone else was being silly. And like, really like when it's, you know, a difficult situation getting the siblings involved, I think, can be a great strategy, too. Julie, did you have any before you took matters into your own hands? Um, honestly, I just kind of stuck to sitting because I was kind of the same as Caden. I loved control. I'm still a control freak. So um, I just kind of would do sitting. Um, and even now, as I do them on my own, um, it's in my thighs. So again, I said I make sure that my legs are against something so that there's more, I guess, leg to grab, I guess you could say, but um, yeah, I definitely think the sitting position is the most effective for me. Thank you. Um, okay, so this next question is actually about injection location, which I think you just mentioned. Um, so the question is, is there any issue with doing the methotrexate injection in the same place weekly? My child prefers 
in the same arm always. Um, so I, Lynn, would you like to weigh in on this one? I mean, generally we would recommend you rotate, um, but you know, when you think about the size of the actual needle and the area on your arm that you can give it, it, there's a lot of spots. The chances of hitting the same spot, you're more likely to win the lottery. I mean, it is preferable to, to change sites, um, but you wanna get that medication in, um, you know, and, and that's maybe some control that the, the child has, if it's just that one arm. Um, maybe having child connect with other youth as well at different events that take place. Um, I know when um, some of our youth are at camp, they'll come back and make changes to the way they do things because they've had conversations with other youth as well. But in terms of the same arm, ideally it's great to, low, uh, to, to rotate sides, but I think you have sort of a large area you can give that methotrexate in. So I think for short term, it's probably okay. One of the, I'll, I'll chime in there, Jennifer, one of the suggestions that we often use that gives a bit of choice, but also kind of forces a bit of rotation is if they have a preferred site, um, I think someone even suggested something like it at like a punch card and there might be, you know, out of five injections, three are your preferred site and two are in a different site and the child chooses, but once that site's been used, it's X'd off, you know, so then we've got four left, right? And so there's there's still some choice involved. Their preferred site is on there more frequently than the others, right? Um, but it, it, it provides kind of that necessity to kind of rotate at least a little bit. So they're still a bit of control, still mostly preferred site, but you're still kind of pushing that, that prefer preference, you know, which is to rotate that site over time. And then, you know, over time, they're gradually going to get more comfortable with other sites because they're going to have to be doing them at least a little bit. Right. Right. Yeah. I think I read that in the chat too. It was the, the poke card and if it went well, or they switch positions, they get a double check. And I think that's a nice, you know, I know Dr. Bernie, you talked all about like the different kinds of rewards and it doesn't have to be monetary or expensive that, they're just motivating um, strategies that you can use, um, which is like the perfect segue into our next question because we have another one that says, besides bribery, what tactics can I use to get my child to take their injections? And I think we'll actually just start because I, Kaden, I'm not sure you shared your sticker dresser when you presented. Um, yeah, so one of the things was, after every shot, I would like, we just bought like a dollar store pack of stickers. And after I had like this big dresser and after every shot, I would like run upstairs, put my sticker on it. And it was like, wow, that's so cool. And then, yeah, it did get overwhelming in the end because of how many there were. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was fun. Mm -hmm. Um, any other strategies when we're, we're, you know, I, you know, obviously, you know, bribery is a, survival tactic as well and can't be blamed we've we've all done it with our kids um any other great strategies that just haven't been mentioned or ideas or a specific mm -hmm. one you can also put them in the chat if you're watching and and have ones that have worked for you i, I usually talk about shared experiences so the fact that it's an opportunity whichever parent brought them to clinic that that's the the child and and parent time that they treasure and they use that for a treasure moment. Um, it can be challenged if it's the only the same parent every time, because then if, if they have to change a parent that they might not feel that. So what's been nice is sometimes if you alternate between parents as to who does the visits, it becomes quality time with the parent. And I think they forget about that. Um, well, we have gotten through an amazing amount of it. I feel like we could write the injection encyclopedia. Uh, <laughs> in our 90 minutes, we've covered a lot of ground. And so I just want everyone to just remember that um, after this webinar, you are not alone. And if you are struggling, there are resources, but also there is a community here. Um, amazing youth like Kaden and Julie who are here to support others. And we heard... Um, from Lynn actually about the power of youth connecting with other youth in that different 
voice and perspective and sharing with someone who, who really gets it and also experiences the injection. And then for parents, like, just don't underestimate the power of support for yourself as well. Um, if you are struggling and, and we have amazing parents here uh, to help you. And um, I wanna thank everyone who is a part of this webinar today. Thank you so much for being here to share your experiences and your expertise. And um, yes, I hope everyone has an amazing Thursday evening. Um, and just thank you again for your time. So thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Dr. Bernie. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Julie. And thank you to Colleen and Kaden. We really appreciate all of your contributions tonight. Um, I'm going to quickly share my screen in closing. Just one second. Here we go. Um, and just have a couple of last words. Get it to move. Um, so if we didn't get to any questions tonight, um, we're just at time. Um, just so you know, we will follow up after the webinar and any questions that you have, if you submit them to info at cassiumfriends.ca, we will do our best um, to answer them. Also, we will let you know when all of those resources are up on the website, as well as tonight's recording. Um, I'd like to say one more thank you to our amazing sponsors, uh, including Nicola Wealth Management, Avvi, Amgen, and Sobi. Um, this session and all of the ones that came before it really wouldn't be possible um, without our partners. Um, don't forget to join uh, the private Facebook group. Um, it really is there for you. It's an amazing resource for whenever you have a question or even just to, to kind of keep an ear open and hear what others are discussing. Um, and again, that's on Facebook at Juvenile Arthritis Canada. Um, and lastly, keep in touch. Uh, CassieandFriends.ca is our website. Um, you can follow us on social media. Um, we have our email up there on the board and, and we really are here. We're 100% focused on kids and families and we just love connecting with everyone in this community. Finally, as I mentioned, Giving Tuesday is coming up and Giving, Susan, Giving Season is amongst us. And um, like our sponsors, we really do rely on the support of incredible families and friends um, and family members. Um, who are able to um, not just make a financial donation, but, but support, volunteer, be there for other parents or youth, um, and contribute in any way you can. Um, Cassie and Friends really is about the strength of the friends in our community. So with that, thank you, everyone. And 